Hey everybody, uh, welcome. Um, I'm going to keep my earphones out for the first little bit of tonight because I want to show you all um, a video from uh, the Sommeliers Guild who are giving a really great overview of Barolo versus um, Barbaresco. Um, and I think they can say it a hell of a lot better than me. So um, with a bit of luck, I can get the, screen, the screen, share screen going. If you don't get the sound, please let me know. And, uh, and I'll have to walk you through it myself. In the northwest corner of Italy, surrounded on three sides by the mountains of the Alps, Lou, are you getting it? lies one of the world's great wine and food regions. In Italian, Piemonte can literally be translated as at the foot of the mountains. Famous for its mushrooms, cheese, and its pasta, the food in Piedmont takes a richer and earthier form than foods from farther south. Several white grape varieties, including Arnais, Cortese, and Moscato, are widely grown throughout the region, with Moscato being best known for the Spumante wines of Asti. The red grapes include Barbera and Dolcetto, but the most famous grape is Nebbiolo. Ricordo della uh, Nebbiolo già nel uh, diciamo 1200-1300 se già sono già notizie. È un tempo talmente lungo che il vitigno ha avuto uh, tempo ad assuefarsi anche al terreno e quindi uh, maturare e dare degli ottimi risultati. Nebbiolo, in spite of the look that it looks like a little grape with very thin skin, is very powerful when it gets to be in the glass. The skin is very thin and it's very tannic and it's one of the elements that gives the characteristics to the, to the wines. First one to bud break in the spring, last one to be picked in the fall. That's why it traditionally is planted in the warmest vineyards that look to the south, so they get more sun in uh, drier conditions. In this area, you have some fogs. The name of fog in, in Italian is Nebbia. And people think that the name of the grape, the name of Nebbiolo, oh, yeah. is coming yeah. from this characteristic. So generically right. speaking, right. talking about the, the, the nose and the smell and the look of Nebbiolo, you would say that it's quite light in color, ruby. I would say if I have to use an adjective. On the nose, is very delicate, like rose petals, flowers, the Nebbiolo grape finds its ultimate expression in Barolo and Barbaresco. The principal city of Alba is situated in the north center of the Lange region, with the relatively small area of Barolo to its southwest, and even smaller Barbaresco to its northeast. These two regions use the same grape, but with different topography, aging requirements, and soil, they produce subtly different wines. So the main difference between Barolo and Barbaresco comes from the soil. The soil of Barbaresco is highly richer in uh, nutrients and fertility than the soil in Barolo. Both wines are extremely complex in the nose, both wines are extremely long and complex in the finish, but the middle palate of Barolo is fuller and the middle palate of Barbaresco is somehow brighter, lighter, a little more ethereal. Back in the days, 100 years ago, they were saying that Barolo was the wine of the kings and Barbaresco was the wine of the queens. Barbaresco has a minimum aging requirement of two years, while Barolo requires three. The Reserva designation demands an additional two years for both appellations. Barbaresco was not on the map until 1894. They started to make wine in a proper way in a Barolo style, and they started to market it as an alternative to Barolo. Slightly lighter, a little easier, a little more delicate. After the Second World War, when the economy was starting to start again, the Gaia family really started to focus and develop the Barbaresco name. And that's when, in 1958, the Produttori was founded with the goal of bringing Barbaresco to the place that it deserved. While most producers release a Barbaresco blended from vineyards throughout the Appalachian, single vineyard bottlings from exceptional sites are increasingly common and demand a premium in the market. It's 
in the very beginning, Barol was very different to what it is now. Usually, the Barol, if we are talking about those centuries, was a sweet wine and sparkling wine. The wine we know as Barolo today is actually a very recent invention, both in its style and in its name. La metà del 1800 eh, si è iniziato eh, per, eh, diciamo, mano della eh, Marchesa di Barolo e del Conte Camillo Benso di Cavour, Barolo. Today, Barolo consists of five major communes. Vineyards and townships of Lamora and Barolo are known for their calcareous moral soils from the Tortonian era, and the corresponding wines are often described as aromatic and elegant in style. In contrast, Saralunga di Alba, Castelleone Folletto, and Manforte di Alba lie on older Helvetian sandstone, resulting in more structured and slow maturing wines. We usually say that, that you can cut the region in two halves. So I'm in the northern part where the soil, you can say, is slightly younger, means sandier soil, softer soil, and usually what they say, Softer soil means softer tannins, smoother wines, more feminine, more approachable, more elegant. The other half of the region, so the southern part, and I want to say villages like Castiglione Poletto or Saralunga, the soil is slightly older. We're talking about more limestone, sandstone. As a result, the wine ends up being a little bit more muscly, a little bit more spicy, a little bit more structured than the northern side of the Appalachian. Inspired by the prestigious prices accorded to the Grand Cru wines in Burgundy, France, Barolo producers began a push for the grape vineyards to be classified according to quality. So talking the, about the crews, so the single vineyards, we don't have such a, a distinctive classification of vineyards like you do have in Burgundy. So what happened in the past, and I'm not talking about a thousand years ago, but let's just go back to the 50s and the 60s, they would just blend the vineyards. There was no interest in showing the, the single vineyards or the single characteristics of each vineyard. The late 1970s and early 80s brought about another change. If you came here in the 50s and the 60s, my grandpa would have told you, oh, buy a bottle of Barolo, but drink it in 25 years. Thank you. Maybe I will tomorrow. Barolo as a wine is not an easy wine, especially in the very beginning because of tannins. Barolo was made for hundreds of years the same way. And then at some point, some crazy winemakers, and I include my dad, Elio, early 80s, late 70s, he was one of the first to start approaching to winemaking with different techniques. And that's when the modern winemaking started happening. Roughly, people have labeled these, these two views about traditionalists on one side and modernists on another side. So the idea with the modernist winemaking was to make more approachable wine. Everybody does green harvest, everybody's organic, so there's not really a big difference in the vineyards. Cellar, that's where we're talking about differences. Modernista, modernist, short maceration. Um, for Altare, we're talking about five days on the skins for Barolo. Tradizionalista, they'll tell you, they'll talk about weeks. Ma la mia, eh, diciamo, tecnica di vinificazione, diciamo, eh, classica, da 25 a 26 e qualche volta anche 28 eh, giorni, eh, a seconda della nata. We have started to introduce the small oak, the barrique for aging. This has created a very big conflict between those two philosophers. È molto importante per me perché è per questo, perché l'Asia, il Barolo, eh, con i, i profumi, gli aromi e, e diciamo, i gusti naturali eh, senza cambiarlo. To make space in the cellar for barrels, he had to buy a chainsaw as well to cut the big botti in pieces. So he was cutting in pieces this botti that one of his ancestors had built. You know, those botti were a hundred years old. The oak itself has such wine usually is combination of salt and small oak because the salt and more tannins from the grapes. A me poi intende poi interessa proprio mettere in evidenza quali sono le caratteristiche del terreno perché sono terreni unici che non si trovano da altre in altre zone viticole. 25 years ago it was a huge fight. In this moment it is not black or white like in that period. It's kind of hard today to put a, a, a strict line to distinguish the styles because today the styles are you know, melting and mixing. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes, Holly was my name. Piedmont is now a hub of Italian food and wine culture. With increasing gastronomic tourism and critical acclaim, prices and notoriety of the region's wines are on the rise. Today, whether traditional, modern, or somewhere in between, the wines of Barolo and Barbaresco indisputably stand among the great wines of the world. The Guild of Sommeliers is a non-profit. And the rest of the, that video is just promoting Piedmont. So let me get out of that. Um, hopefully this gives a little bit of an overview and certainly um, the inspiration for my putting this together tonight is a, a, a big watershed for me personally was finally understanding that uh, Barola and Barbaresco produce, uh, are coming from the same grape but end up with a characteristic that's drastically different from each other. And uh, maybe tonight tasting these six wines and having worked through these uh, the, earlier this afternoon, they're pretty good expressions of what we of, of what Silvio and Maurizio were talking about in terms of uh, in terms of the defining styles. So next we're going to go to the PowerPoint, but I'll take you through just a couple of the characteristics of them. Okay, can you, everyone see that? Yes, I'm assuming you can. All right. So, referring to uh, uh, RobertParker.com, he narrows down into Barolo and Barbaresco 2016 accordingly, rating 95 out of 100 for Barbaresco 16 and 97 for the Barolo. Uh, certainly, uh, talking about Barbaresco being more forward and approachable. 97 being, uh, uh, Barolo being more a, a superb vintage, chasing on the heels of Barbaresco in terms of approachability because the, the fruit uh, is so forward and of such a decent content. Uh, some of the things that came out, let me just go back here. Uh, when on release, a lot of the wine critics were hailing this as, as, as the best in the decade or in decades before. We've certainly seen a couple of interesting vintages since 16, uh, but certainly this, this vintage seems to be standing out still, uh, despite uh, some really successful releases later. Um, well, how it's being defined is in terms of uh, a long harvest, a long slow harvest, uh, great timing of, of water and heat, uh, and the results in both Barbaresco and Barolo or a purity or a delicacy, sense of harmony about the wines. So the case for Barbaresco, um, we've got three of the uh, Barbaresco from uh, Giorgio Pellicero tonight. Uh, maybe at this point, you will have worked through the six wines in terms of phenolics. Um, the big giveaway is the color. Uh, you're going to see uh, the quality of uh, the, the color of the Barbaresco is very, very bright in comparison to the Barolo. Sorry? Oh, someone's yelling at his kid. <laughs> yeah, let me mute that. Uh, so that's definitely going to be the first thing that you're going to notice out of the Barbarescos. Uh, the other thing that um, has come, come forward really strongly for me tonight is how the Fontana Freda stands up from the Serilunga d'Alba uh, uh, in terms of approachability, roundness, the sense of completeness about the wine um, that, that's going to stand out as you work your way through these. So hopefully by now you might have had a smell of each of them and should be forming an opinion on which of the six have a fresher, brighter, more aggressive point of view on the nose. For me, the, uh, the three Barbareschi are really quite similar from a phenolics point of view uh, tonight with uh, the Tulin, wherever it's sitting in this lineup, is showing the, the classic drivers of coolness, menthol, licorice. When I say coolness, uh, leading into, into that at menthol eucalypt kind of component. 
The tulin's also well known for having the chewiest of tannins amongst the three of them. And the Venotu is, uh, for me, of the three that we're looking at, uh, the one that's the closest to how I would make a mistake and think it's burgundy. Um, it, has, it has a kind of uh, freshness and uh, is, is a jazziness about the, about the wine that uh, will make it distinctive. And once we reveal the numbers of the jars, it'll probably stand out even more for you guys. So having a look at the comparison of the three different Barolo, uh, we've got Fontana Freda is from Cerro Longa uh, and Pecanino and Gisolfi are from Bursia. Um, they're both, uh, in terms of, uh, the, the Bursia sits within the Monte, Monteforte d'Alba, excuse my um, pronunciation, and Fontana Freda from Cerro Longa. Um, a lot of people will say that Cerro Longa d'Alba is uh, the one that's, uh, uh, by comparison, the more structured of, of, the, of the Baroli, uh, whereas the wines from Barolo and Lamora are leading more into the elegance. It's interesting tonight because once you get an idea of what these wines actually are, um, it's quite surprising how incredibly resolved the Fontana Freda is tonight in comparison to the other two. Uh, for me personally, from the three Barolos, I'm feeling that the Fontana Freda, maybe you can start to identify, hopefully it's the same in your glasses. The Fontana Freda has just got this round, beautiful finesse, all embracing finesse about it tonight that's really appealing. Um, of the other two, the Pecanino uh, is probably more ready to drink than the Gisolfi. For me, the Gisolfi is giving more of the tannic structure than uh, Pecanino. Pecanino is definitely, definitely more charming and more finessed than the, than the Gisolfi tonight. Interesting to note about um, Monforte d'Alba um, is that it was the first, of, uh, you, you might remember in the, in the video presentation where Maurizio was, uh, was talking about um, 1894 being this big breakout time when they were starting to recognize uh, the validity of single crews or single sites. And, it, and uh, Bussia was the very first uh, in that history in 1894 to actually start recognizing, start recognizing the, um, the sites. So I'm gonna stop that sharing for a moment and just go back and talk to you guys a little bit now. So any thoughts on, in terms of the phenolics, which one might be the most, uh, the more appealing of the six? Let me get the chat room up. No one's talking tonight. One, five, and six for me. Can't pick. Okay. One, five, six. Okay, so with those, you've got a spread of both Barolo and uh, Barbaresco. Um, maybe it's a good time to talk a little bit about um, this notion of masculine and feminine. So it always seems really interesting to me. Uh, you know, in today's political niceties, we'll dance around what's masculine, what's feminine. And it was interesting how historically they described it as Barolo being the king and Barbaresco being the queen from a stylistic point of view. In today's day and age, I know quite a few kings or queens, which probably mixes that whole idea up quite, quite a lot. So uh, we might have to form our own opinions on that. Um, Colin, regarding the Barbareski, you're saying that five and six are New Oak. If I have it correctly, all three Pelicero see New Oak, uh, as well as um, uh, New, New World American and French Oak. Um, that it has a reputation, as does number six. Uh, for the use of American oak. And in fact, if I remember correctly, uh, um, number six uh, employs a, a consultant. No, uh, Lou will confirm it a little bit once we open, take the labels off, an international consultant for, uh, for the making of the wines. One, four, and six, Barbareski. Uh, is that based on the color? Color's a dead giveaway for Barbareski. Sorry, that, that was me. Um... Yeah. Um, the colour for a start, and then the flavour profile. The flavour okay. profile to me confirmed what the colour was indicating. So what it should show. All right. uh, maybe shall we have a vote for one that we prefer? 
Anybody else want to put the hat in the ring? One for six lighter. Yeah, you know, Hasheng, number four is really, really interesting. Uh, it's, 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 I've, I've never looked at it in context of its sibling labels before. Uh, and I have a reaffirmed appreciation for that brand, um, having looked at it tonight. Um, but I agree with you, one and four are definitely manifesting lighter. For me, I found six a little bit more tannic. Uh, it might just be my glass. Um, but maybe I should let you know at this point, the uh, Barbareski are two, three, and five. Number two, three, and five. You're going to find, uh, for me anyway. The, uh, the exact opposite then, yep. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> for me anyway, the, um, the one that's the, probably the most, uh, the, the sort of biggest and most flamboyant will be number five, the Benotu. Um, it's... Uh, and also many people will say that it would probably be of the three be the one that's the most easily confused with Barolo because it manifests so much of the tar and roses. Yeah, four, uh, I didn't get four as a harsh Italian color. I found, uh, for me, I found four tonight really welcoming. I can't remember which one of these three single vineyard Barbarescos are a favorite of Ronaldo's, but uh, it's probably the one that sold out, which should be the Nobiola. Definitely number five is the most forceful of the three Barbarescos. Going back to what I was saying a little bit earlier about uh, the difference between Busia and Serra Lunga Dalba. Do you think maybe of the three Barolos, you can pick out which one comes from Sierra Lunga, the silkier, sorry, the, the more classic, the more rounded and rustic of the, of the, of the Barolos? It's gonna be uh, number four is Sierra Lunga. Number one and six are the wines from Busia. It's interesting for me because I think that number one is showing a lot more resolved than number than number six. Number six for me is giving lots and lots of tannin. It just um, it just feels for me number six is the least ready to drink of of all six wines tonight. Do you agree, Luke? No, oh, sorry, I'm I'm way off here. I'm really way off. Okay. So far as, as the indicators, I would have expected the Barolos to be the lighter colours, and they're not. It's the other way. Oh, sorry, the the Barbarescos to be the lighter colours, and they're not. It's the other way around. No, well, certainly uh, no. Uh, if you're following the the expression, the Barbaresco is always going to be the fresher, the more forward, therefore the darker. The Barolo, by definition, is always the lighter of the two. I thought your notes had it the other way around. Yeah. No. Oh, okay. Right. I wasn't paying attention. We, must, Sorry. we misunderstood. Misunderstood. <laughs> uh, you'll notice when uh, Sylvia was talking, she was going on about how Barolo was that sort of ruby garnet color, and Barbaresco is definitely a, a richer, uh, more fertile uh, flavor uh, than, uh, than Barolo. She then makes the point that if you take uh, Barolo and divide it between north and south, North has slightly more fertile soil than the South. And so she's making an argument for where she is with Elio Altare being, uh, she was quite political about it by saying that the argument is that the softer and more, uh, more, more silty the soil, uh, the softer the Barolo. So let me just take you to the lineup, which might make a little bit clearer. Uh, well, the so colour, okay, now that we've established that the colour, the Barbaresco is supposed to be darker in colour. Brighter, they, yeah, yeah. They certainly are darker, no doubt about that. No, that won't put me. Let me see if I can just pull up the lineup for everybody. It's hard to call them brighter. Brighter is lighter. <laughs> Hold on a second.
So that's your lineup. It's uh, Pecanino that has uh, the consultant for land, is it, Lou? No, I'm confused with somebody else. No, no, that was no, no. Uh, that was Kashina Bruni. Oh. No, none, none of these, all these guys make their own. The one that I that I think I like the least tonight is number six. It's interesting if you drill down into the three Barbarescos, two, three, and five. Um, Tulin is often for me showing a, a riper, plumper kind of uh, flavor profile. Um, it has for me more of a round kind of mid palate, sort of sits in the mid palate. Um, it also sometimes gives a little bit um, of that uh, purple talc kind of uh, nose. What are you saying about the length? Are you talking about the length, Colin? Shortest finish. Are you putting it, are you comparing it to the, the two other Barolos? When I'm looking at the three, sorry, Baresco, when I'm looking at the three Barbarescos side by side, so uh, two, three, and five, I think I probably prefer five of the three. And that's probably because it's just a bit more aggressive, a bit more, you know, that, that descriptor of jazziness definitely seems to show up more in five. Hey, sorry, I was just trying to find the mute button, but I think um, I was just comparing it just in, in general. I mean, just uh, face value, it just seemed to be shorter than the rest. Okay. Um, just question. Now that I can yeah. see all, all the stuff in a row, um, are any of these, like, like, which of these guys are known to be as quote unquote more modern, uh, which for me is Fontana more- Fredo, not at all. Um, okay. Pecanino is definitely an older style. Lou will correct me if I'm wrong. And I think that uh, Giuseppe is probably of the three Barolos, the most modern in style. Uh, people will talk about Giorgio Pellicero as being quite modern in terms of um, the amount of oak that he gives his Barbarescos. Uh, but it, it was an interesting comment from Sylvia uh, Otare tonight saying that 25 years ago, people were so obsessed about you know, the modernist Barolo and the classicist Barolo and the, the styles of Barbaresco. And what she's, what she's saying is she's starting to see a merging of styles where uh, one has to be uh, quite microeconomic about how you view a label and decide with just plainly whether you like it or not, uh, as opposed to looking at uh, the different, uh, different approaches. I would say that uh, Altare probably is the most radical with um, only a five day maceration. Um, I, I, the, the, um, her father, Pedro, I think his name is Pedro, led the charge um, for the for the modernists, definitely. I think definitely what comes through. Uh, I'm happy to throw the king and queen thing aside, but what comes through tonight for me is how the Barbarescos definitely show this brightness. This uh, I want to say ripeness, but it's it's not a ripeness. It's just a more sort of aggressive position in phenolics and palette that, uh, relative to the Barolos. At this point in time, and I've, I've got to sort of say that uh, really clearly, is that the big difference between uh, that's evolved uh, in Barolo and Barbaresco is this approachability at an earlier stage. I'm actually really happy to drink that Fontana Freda right away. And uh, it's unusual because uh, for a few years now, we've been selling the the back vintages of Fontana Freda. And I always found them kind of slowly peeking around the corner of being mature. But really, you've got to, you've got to go far back to, to find the jewels. I remember uh, about eight years ago, Lou and I ended up in Italy and for some reason ended up with, um, uh, it was Borgogna, not Fontana Freda, but very much the same kind of house styles. And they're opening 50s and 60s. 
which we managed to uh, get a, a look in on. And uh, it was profoundly interesting how wines that were that are 60 years old are showing such brightness of fruit. So um, definitely that old school style, there's a case for it. There really is a case for keeping it neutral in oak, not, you know, not giving it anything more than absolutely the bare minimum of that kind of exposure. But as uh, uh, Sylvia pointed out, uh, the market needs something now. And that, that's, uh, it's ended up being something that drives a lot of people to produce a Barolo that's ready earlier. I think for me, uh, the Pecanino is showing a classic house style. Uh, I think it's, it's Giorgio Pecanino, isn't it? Lou? I think so. Um, it, it has this kind of silky Orlando. Silver. Orlando. Yeah. Oh, Orlando. It has this kind of silky, uh, there's a sort of cashmere texture to the wine. And all these wines manifest that. Even this at such a young stage is already showing that. So any thoughts on wine of the night? If you want to throw a number down in the chat room, I'll be delighted to uh, translate your votes to the, to the wine, various winemakers. Anything that anyone prefers? I'm going number two one. Two, two, three. One. Two. two. Five, another for three, four, five, that's going for one. Why, well, you can't vote twice. <laughs> the two of us. Oh, the two of you, all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I am torn between one and two, so. Yeah, yeah I, I it's interesting twice. for me because I really love number one tonight. It's um, it's really great. I, I was lucky enough to taste um, something about six years older, uh, not so long ago, and that I'm just so attracted to his style of Barolo. It's just that easy gliding sort of flavor profile. Uh, so it looks like four. So it looks like number two is, pull, is winning it by, by a fraction tonight. Is there a retail yeah. price on number two? Number two is not available. You know, it's so funny. It's actually Murphy's Law that uh, whenever we do one of these tastings, the one that everybody loves is the one that's sold out. <laughs> yeah, but normally, do you have an indicative price? Yeah, it's around about $100. I think we have some 2015 on the site. So when I send you guys a copy of the recording, um, I'll send you the link to the full Pelissero range. I think there's 13 and, and 15 of the Nobiolo available. If the 13's there, take it. Because for me, 13 and, 16, 13 and 16 seem to follow the, the same sort of trend stylistically. Okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and does that count for all of the, this range? Uh, Price-wise? No, I'm sorry, the year. Uh, everything we're looking at tonight is 16, yep. but um, there is some depth in all of them. We have a lot of Fontana Breda going right back to 99 on the site. Uh, with Gisolfi uh, and Pecanino, there's some very well-priced. You'll notice tonight, I mean, the thing that really stands out quite strikingly is the price difference between the Barolo and the Pelissero. Admittedly, the Pelissero are, you know, it's a uh, blue chip that's, you know, it, it's not Gaia, but it's uh, in the right end of town in terms of quality of Barbaresco. Uh, Barbaresco, as you know, can get a heck of a lot more expensive, but the value plays for me uh, is it, for the Pecanino and Gisolfi every time. Mm -hmm. I think we even have some Pecanino that goes back to 2012 on the site. Is there what a I'll do, what, uh, uh, what I'll do is... I will uh, send you links to all of the brands. Make it easier if you take a look. Okay. Because we carry a... quite a lot of Pecanino and Gisolfi. 
Why do you, what's your reason for liking Fontana Freda the least? And I'll forgive you for the spelling mistake. <laughs> I'm getting a rude side say to me. <laughs> I think that the reason why I, I was drawn to Fontana Freda the most tonight is uh, uh, it's out of most of the Fontana Fredas I've ever drunk, this one is showing a sense of readiness uh, at a very youthful stage, uh, far more youthful stage than many of the Fontana Fredas before. We have a lot of the Fontana Freda single vineyard uh, wines as well. Uh, I'm not sure of the relationship, but Mirafiore, I think, is a wholly owned estate of Fontana Freda. I think that's how it works. And uh, we have a number of the, the Mirafiores as well. Um, they're certainly a lot more focused. I mean, I think there's 87 sites that contribute to Fontana Freda Barolo. 87 different uh, 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 um, single sites, whereas uh, Merafiore grills down into really, really tiny vineyards. And I think it's probably their, uh, their more prestigious or uh, respected uh, sites. But it's more expensive. Uh, you're looking at uh, somewhere between $110, $130 a bottle. So, Lou, with the Gisolfi, What's the reason for you loving it the most? Is there something that jumps out about it? Um, I voted for five. Oh, oh sorry, five, which is six, sorry. Um, close call. The Venotu. Uh, close yeah, close yeah. call for me between number one and number number one, and uh, number five, actually. Right. Uh, Die went for number one with number five second. I was the other way around. Um, right. oh, it's ticking all the boxes for me. It's just, you know. It's super appealing, right? For me, it just yeah. seems to uh, demand attention uh, as opposed to the other two, Barbareski or uh, the Tulin's that sort of round plumper, uh, uh, parfait, uh, uh, not parfait, a uh, talc kind of um, flavor profile. Um, so, yeah, Venotu definitely, um, well, and it's also also because the tannins are uh, moving away from that that sandy sandpaper uh, type of element into yes. the silky range. Yes, yeah. The, the Pecaninos are more advanced in terms of that um, transformation, but you know, I can't. I just remember uh, old man Muscarello there when we. Yeah. <laughs> The one that told us to get lost. Well, he told you. He told you to <laughs> I'm blaming it. your dodgy Italian uh, uh, pronunciation, but anyway. Well, but when, when he finally emerged from the mold, yeah. he, he was, remember, integrated with the mold in his cellar. Yeah. Um, when he finally did emerge, his, his missus uh, put him in his place and said, you know, the magic of our Barolos is when uh, Italini... Vano dalla sabbia alla setta, which means that when the tannins turn from sand to silk. I remember that, yes, yes. Yeah. And, and that, that's before you got kicked out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, and that's exactly what I look for in, in Nebbiolo, in whether it be Barolo or Barbaresco. With this grape, it can be really tough up front. And that's why Silvia is all about your. Know, Lower mass, uh, less time maceration. Short because maceration. Yeah, it means the tannins aren't anywhere near as aggressive. And she's she's selling to an American market that if it's got yep. tannins, they just won't drink yeah. it. Right? They won't drink yeah. it. Uh, in Italy, they won't drink Silvia's wine because if it hasn't got tannins, it's not Barolo. It's not Nebbiolo. Yeah. They look for those tannins and they match their foods with it. They 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 go out of their way to match their food, looking for that tannin yeah. structure, but. Again, with the, those words ringing in my ears, I like it when they're not so aggressively tannic, but they are starting to... to yeah, tip into that. I mean, for me, that. out of the three, Barolo, the one that just, I, I come back to time and time again is Pecanino. For yeah. me, the, that silkiness is there. And contrasting to Gisolfi, 
where it's just this raspy, for me anyway, there's, by contrast, the tannins are just so overt and aggressive still. Um, yeah, because again, look at the markets they're going to. Mm. Orlando, Orlando sells 80% of his production into the US. Oh, okay. So he's making a wine that, where the tannins are less aggressive earlier in the piece. Mm. So his maceration, I'd say, if I remember right, his maceration is about 18 days. Okay. Right? Gizolfi actually make, they make three different... Um, uh, yeah, there's three sites, right? Yeah. There's three different Barolos, and he, he takes a different approach with each one. So therefore, you know, this one, this one is his traditional one. So that's why it's, it's still quite aggressive on the tannins. Right, okay. Giorgio, you know, Giorgio is a, a complete haul in, in terms of the, the US market, right? He'll do whatever they want. And, you know, he's got French barriques. He's got new, new French oaks sitting out there. And if someone says, is that new French oak? He goes, well, what do you want it to be? How much do you want? Yeah. <laughs> and I say, oh, we only want traditional. Well, come around the corner. <laughs> you know, Giorgio is a great sales guy, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, he's he's un, unapologetically chasing a market, uh, yeah. and he will change his style uh, from year to year. So the Venotto's got a very different oak treatment to the Nubiola, which has got a very different oak treatment to Tulin, and that's why you know that's why you're finding these differences. But yeah. uh, he's a master in in playing with what the market wants. But again, he wants the tannins to be, uh, yeah, whatever his customer wants. So, and his he's main customer again is the US market. So they're, they're more approachable. It's interesting for me that uh, the three Barbareschi, the Tulin is the one that's tracking what it should do in terms of evolution in the glass. It's rounder and softer now. And that might be why David's changed his bet to the, to the Tulin as his favorite because it's starting to integrate more quickly than the other two. Tulum is made, out of the three, it's made for earliest drinking. That's oh, the, really? Yeah, it's made oh, okay. for earliest drinking in terms of window. Venotto is his um, flagship, you know, sort of 20, 30 year um, prospect. When so the Nubiato is priced similar to Tulin, is it? Well, they're all fairly bunched together. Um, Tulin's the top. Um, I don't know, it's about 100 bucks or something. Yeah. Um, Nubiolo is the next raft down, about mid-80s. And I think the okay. Tulin, Tulin would be just slightly cheaper. I think the Venoto is the, um, the smallest production of the three, if yes. I remember. Yes, very much so. Very right. much so. It also the one that gets the most new oak. All right. Which makes it more expensive to make. I would love to drill down more into the Mirafiori and Fontana Freda. Maybe you can have a whisper into their ears and see if we can get some more back vintage from them next time. Oh, we show them. you can get it. Yeah, <laughs> it's about question of price. Yeah. Yeah. So we've seen, for those on the call, yeah, Fontana Freda and Borgogna and, and uh, Casaí de Mirafiori was all part of the same group, which is under the Borgogna, Giacomo Borgogna. Uh, brand. So they've got one of the most extraordinary sellers on the planet in terms of back vintage. They've got a hundred years of back vintage of their wines. Um, five years ago when we started plundering those, or eight years ago when we first started plundering those back vintages, they were priced at about you know, 10 to 20 percent above the, the current vintage. That ain't no more. It's, that, that, that game is over. They don't so, need to. Yeah. That game is over. Also, the, you know, so the stuff where I'm, I was getting uh, some of the, the banner years, like 96 and 99, 98, so just, you know, they've, they've trebled now in the last three Really? Years. Yeah. yeah. So the Burgundian, the Burgundian buyers have clearly hit Piedmont. Oh, absolutely. No doubt. Absolutely. Um, but, yeah, if you want a 20-year-old Fontana Ferrer, yeah, we, we could we could get those for about 90 bucks five years ago. Now they're about 200. Okay. Because I remember Mirafiori La Rosa, which of their single vineyard sites was the one I liked the most. Yeah. And we were doing that at about 110, something like that. Not, not anymore. Not anymore. No. Not for not for the older vintages. You'll get yeah. that for the you get that for the latest release. Yeah. But not the back back school. 
afraid not. That, 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 that horse has left the stable. Well, on that note, uh, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Um, our next uh, tasting is the um, Nicola Real uh, in two weeks, uh, the 24th. We have a few seats left for that. We're looking at the 200 Monges label the, of, of their range um, from the Rioja. I hope you guys can join us. I have the very hard task now of doing a dinner with some friends. Uh, it's nothing but blind bottles of Bobaresco and Barola because they reckon I'm way too smug when I do these blind tastings because I have all the answers. And so they, they're fully intending to take me down a peg or two tonight. So uh, I, I expect myself to be completely bereaved by them. <laughs> but uh, thank you all for coming. And I hope you can join us again. I'll send the recording out tonight if you want to take a closer look at what everybody tasted uh, their opinions during the night. So one good night. You go. Can I ask yeah, one yeah, question? Yeah. Sorry, Dan. Um, the rule of thumb, is there such a thing across that whole range you just displayed, the six that we've tasted tonight? You said one of them, like two, 2016 is a good year, that's all of them. And yeah. you mentioned one of them, number one, I think. 13's great. Uh, right. uh, is that applicable across all the entire range? Uh, certainly for Tuscany, uh, 16 is great. Yep. Um, and 13 is fantastic. Uh, 10 is probably the pinnacle in the last decade. I Shoot me down if I'm wrong, Lou, but I, I take the position that 10 is probably the most exciting in terms of classic Tuscan style. Nine was hotter, so uh, go forward. Except, except these are Piemonte. Uh, sorry, so, oh, you're asking about Piedmont. Sorry, I'm getting my, my, my channels mixed up. But I think the same thing follows uh, for, for Barolo as it does for Tuscany, right? The vintages. Well, Italy's been blessed. It's really only had one bad one in the last eight years, right? Uh, or 10 years. You know, 14 was a bit of a wipeout for everywhere except Sardinia and, and Sicily. Because yeah, it was just a miserable, cold, wet summer. Um, 13 was excellent. 15 was excellent. 16 was excellent. 17 was hot. 18 was excellent. So they've been blessed. They really have been. Um, 10 was great. 11 was great. Yeah. So oh, the only one to avoid really is 14 generally, David, um, unless it's coming but out of the... Do, would you agree that in terms of Barolo, it tracks Tuscany in terms of 13 and 16 being similar in style? Uh, that year, oh, yeah. That's not generally, that sort of it's not generally a good rule of thumb because they've got totally different climates, right? But yeah. 13 and 16 were good in both areas, yes. All right. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank Thanks, everybody. It was great. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you. Bye.